from civil with Lord Flanders. From civil rights to labor rights, can the American labor movement bring it all together? Today on the Laura Flanders Show, we talk about Bernie Sanders, the Eric Garner case, and more with Larry Hanley, president of the Amalgamated Transit Union. All that and later in the show, Morgan Phillips tells us about how to bring science fiction and fantasy into direct action. And a few words from me on the U.S. corporation that pretends to be based in Ireland. It's all coming up. Welcome to our program. Will Labour endorse Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, or someone else entirely? Our next guest was the first union president to speak up about next year's election in the U.S., and he sounded pretty sweet on Vermont socialist Bernie Sanders. Larry Hanley is a former bus driver, now president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, which represents 200,000 workers across the U.S. and Canada. Ever since his election in 2010, he's been outspoken on everything from greening the economy to outsourcing public jobs. We're glad to have him back on the program. Larry, glad to have you. Glad to be here, Warren. Tell us to start about your members. Who are they? My members uh, drive and repair and clean buses uh, throughout the United States and Canada. We have members in uh, 46 states. We have members in nine provinces in Canada. And uh, we have some people that also work uh, in administrative positions for county officials uh, in various places in Florida, for example, um, operate ferries and some ambulances, uh, but primarily uh, transit workers. We do a lot of coverage on this program of what is generally and rather vaguely called the new economy. Like, mm -hmm. If we don't like this economy, what might replace it? What might be better? Has it ever been better? Uh, is it better in different places uh, around the world? What place do you see... Um, public transport playing? What place do you see it occupying in this sort of new economy? What's your picture? Well, first of all, uh, young people are abandoning cars in record numbers. Um, there are fewer uh, people, I think in the 18 to 25 year age group, that have driver's license licenses than did in 1960. They are more urban. They're moving to cities. Our cities are expanding at record rates. And young people want transit. We believe that with overcrowded cities, and they're only going to be more crowded, um, if, if, if our governments can recognize the trend, we believe transit has a huge future in that economy and what's coming you know, in the next 20 years. Uh, but that's a big if because, mm -hmm. frankly, um, we have unlimited funds to blow up the, the world. But whenever you say, let's build a highway, a bridge, or, or add a bus, where are we going to get the money from? That's yeah. the question in Washington. That's what we have to overcome. So is that one of the things that attracts you to the Bernie Sanders campaign, Vermont <laughs> Socialist running for president? Bernie Sanders, well, I'll say what I've said to some others. Um, I love Hillary Clinton. I love many of the things she's done. Um, she has been, um, in many ways, uh, a courageous hero, uh, I think, for Americans and for women all over the world. But what, it, what do you say when loving Hillary Clinton is just not enough? And that's really the problem. Because what Bernie and Elizabeth Warren have been doing is speaking to issues that we know are true. Right. That we know in our hearts, for example, that the bankers got away with this depression. They got away with the biggest bank robbery in history. Um, while, you know, the old story, you know, if you steal a loaf of bread, you go to jail. Uh, we know that, and we know that Bernie and Elizabeth Warren are speaking to that. Mm -hmm. Things like Social Security that's been under attack for the last 10 years. You know, Bernie says, look, um, defend Social Security? No, oh, we have to increase Social Security. And he's right, we can. There are other solutions. And the problem with mainstream elected officials, both Republicans and Democrats, is they are trapped in the same box and we can only, for example, the war is something that's something we can't talk about. Mm -hmm. We can't say it's wrong to bomb all over the world. You mean the one that Hillary Clinton supported? She did. No question. And Bernie didn't. And that's true. So somehow or another, I, well, let me, let me just go back to the, the question of labor unions and, and Bernie. Bernie right now is speaking sincerely, not only with passion, but with a record to the issues that our members care about. He's speaking about changing the way we do business in Washington um, in very specific terms. 
I would contrast that with Barack Obama, who spoke in generic terms about changing Washington. Um, but I think that Bernie has the opportunity. He's no, no Barack Obama. But he has the opportunity, by raising these issues, um, to excite a lot of people and to get people focused on what matters, not just people who follow him, but also mainstream politicians. So why not come on, Larry? Why not just come on out and endorse the guy? Well, um, we're going to go through a process, and I'm not joking, and it's not going to be a phony process. We are, look, the obvious concern about Bernie is can he win? And most people um, would say he can't, would say it's impossible in this environment for him to win, and that may well be true. And the hope that I think most people I know in the unions, certainly at the leadership of unions, I think a lot of members tend to be a little more hardcore on this. Mm -hmm. But the hope we have is that through the excitement that Bernie's generating, we can begin a whole new debate, not just about who the president is, but about where we're going as a country. And that's more important than the individual. Why not endorse Bernie? I'm not trying to escape the question. You can make a little history right here. We're right not here. ready. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that today. But, um, but we have not ruled it out, I can tell you that. And, and there are many people who would rule us criminally insane for saying that, but we are not ruling it out. I trust you, trust you telling the truth. I'm trusting there's a process, all of that. But I would put quite a lot of money on the fact that at the end of the day, you and most of the big labor organizations will root for the Democrat who is the most well-funded already, probably the most conservative and the most deemed likely to win. And you'll do that because your members will say, well, we want to be at the table. But being at the table for as many elections as I can remember has meant putting enormous amounts of union dues into candidates who promise things to labor and then don't deliver. Barack Obama promised card check. Make it easier for you to have union elections. Uh, never happened. We never even heard about it again. Why do, we keep, why do you keep doing this? First of all, unions are not at the table. Uh, have not been in the time I've been in Washington. I was actually at a table in the White House uh, at a meeting with the president, with all the members of the executive council of the AFL-CIO in 2012. And it was something of a scripted meeting. There were three of us who were going to speak to the president. And the rest of us were there essentially witnessing the meeting. And I witnessed the president tell us, those of you who work, who represent workers in the public sector, need to get used to the idea that your members need to have their wages come in line with the private sector. My jaw dropped. <laughs> this is the leader of the free world, the leader of the Democratic Party, the person in whom our members place their hope and trust and faith. And worked. And work. And he just told us that his view was that public sector workers uh, would have to be getting haircuts, economic haircuts. Uh, nonetheless, we went out, and this answers part of your question. After that meeting, we went out. I personally went out, and I was working on Election Day in Cleveland, Ohio, trying to get the vote out to elect Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Because 2012, like 2016, will, will found us in a place where the options were heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. And frankly, um, and I know this doesn't really answer the deep questions, but I think Bernie Sanders does, mm -hmm. the deep questions of how can you cooperate with a government of either party that is disassembling the labor mm -hmm. movement before your eyes, that is sending jobs overseas, that is eliminating regulations that protect workers and families? And I think the answer is, in the end, you can't. Um, but then the question becomes, <laughs> how do you lead your members in a way that can actually be successful in making change? Mm -hmm. That's a far more complicated question. Well, how do you, and do you draw any lessons from the party of Podemos in Spain, fighting a good fight right now for the next election, a party that didn't even exist a year and a half ago? Syriza in Greece may not have gotten the best deal out of the Europeans, but better than anyone that and they tried. Uh, preceded them. They could have said, their people could have said, well, we should just stick with what we've got because it's too risky building something new. Uh, you don't do that. On the other hand, you recognize the, the limitations of your own power. 
Uh, and at the same time, I think you recognize the opportunities that you have. So what we've done, and I can only speak to my union now, transit workers in the U.S. and Canada, um, we have not pinned all our hopes on the electoral system, whether it be the presidency or any other particular office. We recognize that the forces against us are huge. And we are trying to organize riders. We have 100 riders who ride our system for every member of our union. And our goal is to get them engaged in the process. And you have some record of that. Wasn't there in New York one of the locals organized, was it Keep America Moving? We were involved in that, yes. A coalition, right? It was a, it was a coalition of us and the TWU that were involved mm -hmm. in that. And we've been doing that all over the country, and we're beginning it in Canada. Actually, Canada, fortunately, lags behind in, in some of the serious anti-worker moves that have happened. Uh, unfortunately, we've lagged behind in catching up also out there. But we've had successes all over the United States. We've had them in Massachusetts. We've had them in Wisconsin in the midst of the Scott Walker recall. We were successful in a small town of western Wisconsin in restoring transit through a ballot initiative. Seventy, this is the interesting thing. In 70% of the times that voters get a chance in the U.S. to vote on raising their own taxes to provide more transit, they vote yes. Yeah. We just did it in Clayton County, Georgia, where the MARTA system in Atlanta um, did not reach Clayton County. And the voters, this is an interesting one, uh, in the election in 2014, the voters in Clayton County came out in huge numbers and voted to raise their taxes to be part of the MARTA system. And on the same day, more people voted in that referendum than voted either for governor or for senator in Clayton County. Voting for public transport. So the issue was more important than the biggest races in the state. You drove a bus for many years in Staten Island, mm -hmm. um, where the family of Eric Garner, the chokehold victim, um, there was recently a settlement made with them. Mm -hmm. Where's your union, how is your union working um, to address racial justice in this country? And do you well, relate to the Black Lives Matter movement at all? Oh, absolutely. I do, personally, without a doubt. Um, I've made it very clear to all audiences in our union that I speak to that this union will stand on the side of justice in every case. Um, Staten Island is a case, obviously, I lived there for many years and I know a little bit about the island. I can tell you my personal view is you could not look at that video and say that that cop was right. You can't. Um, on the other hand, and this is not an on the other hand I excuse the actions of that cop. It was an awful, awful thing that happened to Eric Garner. Um, and he was a victim. No question about that. Not escaping that. On the other hand, these are systemic issues. Yeah. When uh, cops kill young people, anyone, um, and we blame just the cop, we're making a big mistake because it is the system that created the violence. It was the decisions. Why is this police department going after and arresting people for selling cigarettes on a street corner to start with? And why do they bring in, you know, 10 or 20 cops to take down a guy in a street? Why couldn't Eric Garner simply be given a ticket? Those are not decisions made by that cop. Mm -hmm. So the brute force, you know, we hire cops to have yeah. brute force. And we have to admit that as a society. But then the leadership of the police department, the leadership of the city, needs to be the adult in the room that restrains yeah. those cops to make sure they don't do things like that. So that, the, the thing, again, it's, it's just like what happened with Michael Brown. We could easily scapegoat that cop and say he, he's a bad guy. And he may well be. Yeah. But we're avoiding the big issues. Bus drivers have an interesting history when it comes to civil rights. You've been in the center of it more than once. Many Thinking times. Of the Birmingham bus boycott. Well, that's interesting because, uh, as you know, uh, it was one of our members who was driving the bus uh, that Rosa Parks got on and refused to give up her seat on. And, and our member uh, notified the police and got her arrested. Um, and Rosa Parks became the best organizer of transit riders in the history of the United States. And that's what our union is dedicated to doing, is, is organizing bus riders. Um, we really could not respect Rosa Parks more for what she did. She was a, a real hero. Uh, and I mentioned to a, a leader, a civil rights leader, a couple of years ago, I told him that I had investigated and found out that the bus driver was actually a member. We checked our roles. And he said, you know, Larry, he was enforcing the law. <laughs> And that's true. And again, uh, one could easily say that was a bad bus driver. Well, no, it was a bad society. You know, it was a bad, bad society. And, and 
and we had we and we've worked a long time and come a long way in terms of achieving justice. We have a long way to go. We're talking around about Labor Day. Why do we have Labor Day when the rest of the world celebrates May Day, May 1st? <laughs> well, primarily because of the Russian Revolution in 1917, um, which, uh, which uh, resulted in a thing called the Red Scare in the 1940s and 50s in the United States. A part of it. Well, okay, so, so what America is completely, um, because we've been taught to be that, anti-communist, anti-socialist, and our country, our official um, record is that uh, May Day is a socialist, communist holiday. So therefore, uh, we currently don't celebrate it. That's just a history lesson for the young people <laughs> watching the show. Larry Hanley, thank you so much. Really looking forward to catching up with you again sometimes.